We worship you, Lord, in the beauty of your holiness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Hear your people praise you.
Good morning. I think I could keep worshiping today. Man. Corey Smith, that was, uh, she owns the Wilmington Conservatory of Fine Arts. That was some of her dancers. Wasn't that beautiful? Great way to worship the Lord. Oh. In the Greek Orthodox uh, uh, Church for hundreds, hundreds of years, um, shortly after midnight, one of the traditions that they do, uh, still do, but have done for hundreds and hundreds of years, is one of them uh, will gather and they'll begin to cry, He is risen. And the people that gather uh, there at that point will echo and say, He is risen indeed. There are certain traditions that I love. Can we do that? I'm going to yell, He is risen. And then will you guys echo, He is risen indeed? Amen and amen. Truly, truly. Come on. Oh, good morning, Daniel and Missy and team up here. Thank you. I don't know if y'all are in the room, but Missy, thank you for your tears and authenticity. I think you broke open all of our hearts this morning. Man, I needed a tissue box up by my seat. (laughs) Oh, Lord Jesus. Okay. um, Let's see. I am in uh, John 6. Um, we gather as a church because he lives. We gather as a, church, as a church because he's risen, and we'll be weaving. I'll weave that into this message, but um, open your Bible to John 6 or scroll on your phone, however you're getting there, um, and we're going to cross-reference sort of later in the message um, Exodus 19. If you want to put your finger there or stick something there, just two verses out of Exodus 19 and also Exodus 16. Man, I'm having trouble collecting myself this morning. <laughs> We're going to read uh, John 6, 1 through 15, and I'm going to have you stand for the reading of God's Word. Squeak, squeak, squeak. John 6, verses 1 through 15. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up to a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take almost a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. And they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves and gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Holy Spirit, would you open your word to us today? Would you examine our hearts? Would you sift us? Would you fill us? Would you convict us? Would you change us? And would you allow the fullness of your person to be lived out in and through everyone here? In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may sit down. Okay, here's what we're going to try to tackle this morning. 
Um, we are going to try to, uh, we're going to look at Jesus um, as the new Moses, uh, just sort of quickly, and that'll hopefully become clear why that's important. We're going to take a look at Philip the realist. Some of you are going, oh yeah, I know that one. We're going to take a look at Andrew, the one who's always bringing people to Jesus. Um, and then we're going to take a look at the boy who gave up his lunch. You know, there's certain people when I get to heaven, I want to go meet. And he's act, this little boy is actually one of them. I would love to go just sit with him and uh, find out what happened and where did you go after that miracle took place. And then we're going to tie this all together um, by an idea that I'm going to circle back to. But it's this idea that Jesus is the God of the dead end. What? We'll circle back to it. Jesus is the God of the dead end. Okay, so a couple things that I think are important as we jump into John 6 that I think is worth understanding is if the Sea of Galilee, if you guys were looking at a map up here and the Sea of Galilee was like this, you have a spot called um, Tabga up here, and then you have a spot on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, about 12 or 15 miles around, if you, if you followed around the Sea of Galilee, um, called Tel Hadar. And the only reason I want to mention this is those of you who, who study scripture and are, are interested, um, you could look at Mark 5. Five, six, seven, and eight. And in, in Mark um, 5, or Mark 6, I think it is, there's the feeding of the 5,000, which takes place at this little place called Tabga. It's an amazing spot. And then in Mark, I think it's 8, um, there's a feeding of 4,000, which happens at this place called Tel Hadar, which is around the other side of the lake. Now, here's why this is interesting and fascinating to me, because uh, the crowd that would have gathered for the feeding of 5,000 would have been all Jewish. Okay? The crowd that would have gathered the feeding of 4,000 on the other side of the lake would have been all Gentile. And the reason that is important, so that's like different ethnicities. I realize that to us, you go Jewish and Gentile. You're like, what does that even mean? But that is different ethnic groups that have lots of hatred and animosity towards one another. So what Jesus is immediately beginning to unfold here is he feeds a group of uh, Jewish people. And that's even worth saying, there is no blonde-haired, blue-eyed people in the mix. Dark skin, dark hair, dark eyes, right? He, he first reaches out to his own people. He was Jewish. And he's establishing that he is the Jewish Messiah in this text and in the feeding of the 5,000. And then what is amazing is if you look at Mark 5, and I'm not going to take you there, but it's worth your study if you're interested. In Mark 5, he actually um, heals a guy who is demon-possessed. Okay? And at the end of that time, he says, go and tell all your people. This guy wasn't Jewish. And this guy went and told all of his people, which lived in the, these 10 cities called the Decapolis. And again, if you had this huge sea of Galilee up here, the Decapolis cities are over here on this side. And so this guy who was healed of being demonized goes and he tells all of these people and likely through his evangelism and sharing the hope of Jesus, all these people come to this place called Tel Hadar and Jesus feeds 4,000. And the reason that becomes so important is because what Jesus is beginning to set up is not only this would be Jesus talking, am I Jesus, the, the uh, Jewish Messiah, but I'm now going to branch out and I'm going to demonstrate that I'm the savior of the whole world. It's this beautiful, like this Jesus is always even contradicting and thrusting things in. And, and what's amazing is I think his, uh, Jesus is some of his most powerful messages are preached without words. And that's really what we want to open today is how can we even understand what happened here and why did it happen and even take a look at this whole idea um, of, of Jesus feeding 5,000 people. Because I would suggest to you that this is one of the great fulcrum points in the Gospel of John. So this is the essence. That there's sort of a build up to this point and then there's a, a slide down to where Jesus is actually crucified um, and then raises again. But here when he's feeding the people, it is the essence of what he has come to do. Okay, so um, just one last little thought on that. Mark is a much more literal and geographical book. So like if uh, I, I got to actually retrace the entire gospel of Mark through the Holy Land and you can go from place to place and there's certain times you can actually sit down and pick up the dirt and go, it's almost assuredly uh, historically, archaeologically and biblically that King Jesus stood in this very spot. It's amazing, absolutely mind blowing. And then you have this book of John that we're in and John is much more... Um, 
He's looking at signs. He's looking at theology. He's looking at the big picture. And I can't fully decipher whether this feeding of the 5,000 is the, the Tabga or the Tel Hadar or some uh, joint explanation of both. But I think it is absolutely powerful as we, as we jump into this. Okay, um, another piece of background that I think is really important is Jesus has been down in Jerusalem. Okay? And in Jerusalem, you got all these educated religious people, right? So, what's important to educated religious people? Rules, that's right. Somebody said it. Yeah, rules. What else is important is uh, kind of fussing about things of the law, fussing about maybe who the Messiah is going to be, what he's going to be like. They have full bellies, and so they, they, they don't care near as much about things like food. Yeah. So what happens here is Jesus has transitioned from Jerusalem. He's gone up into this area of Galilee. And what's fascinating is he spent 18 months of his three years in ministry, actually, in this area of northern Galilee. And it's among poor, impoverished, like salt of the earth, like peasant people. That's who he is among here. So they live close to the land. They're laboring hard for subsistence wages. They farm. They fish. They're, they're living out in small uh, huts. And Jesus is going from village to village. And so what's uh, amazing is there's this um, sharp contrast, I think, that begins to emerge here between um, the more sophisticated Jerusalem thinkers and then the more simple um, peasant thinkers uh, that are up in Galilee. And yet look where Jesus chooses to spend more than half his time. I'm glad he came for those that are simple. Come on. Okay. So uh, I think the other thing that is essential as we get in and even begin to look at Jesus as the new Moses is the feeding of the 5,000 is the only sign to appear in all four gospels other than the death and the resurrection of Christ. So what's that tell you? It's really important. Somebody got that right. Thank you. Way to go. So it is, it is really, really important. So let's, let's dig in here. Jesus is the new Moses and see if we can uh, take a look at a couple of things here. Um, so cross-reference with me, Exodus 19, verses 2 and 3. Let's just flip back there, see if I can find it. Okay, Exodus 19, verses 2 and 3. We just preached through Exodus, by the way, if you wanted to go back and listen to some of that. But here's what it says, uh, verse, uh, Exodus 19, verse 2. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered into the desert of Sinai. Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. So 2.5 million people now are going out for a camping trip in the hot desert. That sounds miserable to me. I don't know about you, but thank you. Uh, so they go out into the wilderness, right? Verse 3, then Moses went up to God. What did he go up on? A mountain. Okay, and the Lord called to him from the mountain. Okay, go back to John 6, starting uh, in verse... One, sometimes after that, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, which is the wilderness. And not only does he go out into the wilderness, it then says he goes up onto a mountain. So what do we immediately begin to see? So Jesus is preaching a sermon here that is far more than simply words. He's actually reenacting in some ways this new Moses where he is coming and he is going out into the wilderness, number one. He is leading people there, number two. And then he's going up onto a mountain, number three. And he's beginning to say non-verbally, I am Yahweh incarnate. I am God in human skin. I have come to lead people to freedom. I have come to fulfill the old Mosaic covenant. And I have come to lead people into life. That's what he's beginning to say. What's interesting in verse 3 of chapter 6, I'm back in John 6 now, but it says, then Jesus went up on the mountainside and he sat down. Isn't it fascinating that he'd sit down? In America, um, when we have something important to say, what do we do? Stand up. We stand up. What, what else do we do? Talk loud. Right? In rabbinic culture, you sit down. And what that begins to symbolize biblically is Psalms 110, I think, I think one it is, actually says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies um, a footstool. And what is he's beginning to even demonstrate here in, in the rabbinic tradition is uh, he is leading um, and he is loving and he is moving from a place of rest. 
not from a place of striving, not from a place of work. So Jesus gets up on this mountainside and Jesus sits down and what happens to the crowd? A hush, a hush falls over the crowd because they you'd be at peace over there with that little one, Nolan. <laughs> A hush falls over the crowd because people are now ready for him to teach. And he teaches from this place of authority because he's seated at the right hand of God Almighty. By the way, we're called as Christians uh, to live from a place of rest. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, if you're here today and you're a skeptic or an atheist or a frustrated former Christian or whatever, I just invite you to rest in this and then go, Lord, if you're real... Would you reveal yourself to me? Ask him, just as, even as we walk through the word this morning. Okay, let's, uh, Jesus is the new Moses. The other thing I want to take a, a quick look at is Exodus 16. So I don't know if you have your finger there or not, but Exodus 16, let's see if I can find it. And we're going to look at verse 2 and 3, just because I think this is essential to understand. Exodus 16, verses 2 and 3. Again, we're thinking about Jesus as the new Moses. Jesus is coming to fulfill the old covenant and institute a new covenant. All right, here we go. Verse 2. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. That's pretty, pretty grumbly, right? There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. No, they're not even talking about their slavery, but they're going to talk about the pots of meat. Interesting. But you have brought us out into the desert uh, to starve uh, this entire assembly to death. Um, verse 4, then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven. What's Jesus demonstrating? He is the bread of heaven. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them. Okay, go back to John 6. Verse 5, Jesus looked up and he saw a great crowd coming towards him and he said to Philip, where shall we go to buy bread for these people? He asked this only to test him. Now, what you have to begin to understand here is Jesus is fully instituting that he is the bread of life, and he is actually beginning, we're going to get into it in the, in the next couple of weeks, but he begins to say, eat my flesh and drink my blood. It's kind of like, what? But what he is demonstrating here before he even goes into his teaching and the sermon is he is the new Moses, he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, and he is leading people to life, and that people actually don't even live on human bread alone, but by the very presence and word that comes from the mouth of God. That's what he's beginning to show and sort of demonstrate in this place. So Jesus does this to test him Philip, uh, but also the other disciples. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, in verse 11, skip down to verse 11 of chapter of John 6. I'm back in John 6. I know we're dancing around, but go down to verse 11. Jesus then took the loaves and he gave thanks. He gave thanks. That's a Greek word. It's eucharistesis, eucharistesis. And that's where we get the word eucharist. What is eucharist? Communion. The Lord's Supper. So what Jesus is actually beginning to institute here in John so wisely as he begins to pen this, remember John is probably not quite so concerned with the minutia details of what exactly is happening. He's far more concerned with the theological significance of this. And so you have all the elements of Passover happening, even that he said early on in the passage that it was, uh, that verse four, the Jewish Passover was near. So John's beginning to say, Jesus at the time of Passover, Jesus who was to become the Lamb of God. Jesus took them out into the wilderness as the new Moses. Jesus went up into the mountain as the new Moses. Jesus is the one who now is going to become the bread of life. He's become the manna that's come down from heaven. And all people, peasants, educated, rich, poor, healthy, sick, all different nationalities are called to come and feast on him. Yeah? Amen. Okay. So the Lord's Supper comes right out of this, and it's this, this idea of the finished sort of work of Christ that's happening here. So, you know, by the way, I can't help but wonder, as, as Jesus is standing there, you've got his 12 disciples around, it's fascinating to me that um, he tests Philip, and then Andrew pipes up, but what are the other 10 doing? 
They're probably like, please don't call on me. <laughs> right? You know it. They're hiding off in the bushes somewhere going, ah, I'm glad he called on Philip. Okay, so but what's fascinating, and I, there's no indication in the, in the Greek, I cannot tell you when or how the miracle happened, but I'm guessing that Jesus didn't give thanks and break the bread, and then all of a sudden, poof, you know, there's just gobs of food. I, I don't think it happened that way. My guess is that what happened is Jesus gave thanks over these simple little barley loaves, which we're going to talk about, and these, these two little fish, which would have been like sardines. Anybody fish? Anybody ever, like, light line for king mackerel or something? I mean, sardines. They're these little, like, yeah, they're just rinky-dink things. Like, we here in America, we would turn our nose up so fast at this meal, you would stand up and leave, I promise you. So Jesus, but he prays over these little loaves, he prays over this boy's lunch, he prays over these two little sardines, and my guess is he begins to hand them to his disciples. And the only thing that I can imagine, and this is Michael, this isn't, I can't pull it from the text, but the only thing that I can imagine is as the disciples get their hands on this bread and they begin to break it, and then they begin to break it some more, and then they begin to hand it to people, and they break it, and then they break it and hand it to someone else, that what you have is this supernatural act that begins to happen right in their midst. And nobody even really knows that it's this massive act of creation that's going on. But there is literally a miracle happening in their midst. Now listen to me. This is just like the modern church at its best. You have no idea it's happening, but all of a sudden you're breaking bread. All of a sudden you're getting in small groups. All of a sudden you're sitting around talking to people. All of a sudden you're up here praying for somebody. All of a sudden you're out encouraging somebody who's walking in. And as you are engaging in the Jesus journey, in the life of Christ, you're breaking bread. You're eating of the bread. And the supernatural and spontaneous growth of the church happens. I can only imagine that sitting there that day, that there was not this, oh my goodness, it happened. But if, if anyone was uh, maybe uh, either smart enough or just curious enough to stand back and look at this thing from like a 30,000 square foot you know, view, they would have seen the bread that just kept being broken and the fish that kept being passed. And all of a sudden, there's food for this multitude. Now, I think another thing that should be at least said or made reference to here is when they say 5,000, this is like in a patriarchy, patriarchal society, so they're counting men. Okay, so how many women could have been there? Maybe 5,000, maybe more. I don't know. There's a lot more women that go to church than men. I think. Come on. Yeah, come on. Clap for it. I like it. How many kids could have been there? Uh, my guess, and I've heard all sorts of scholars take on this, but my guess is there's at least 15,000 people there that day. This is a multitude. And what's amazing is I've stood in this spot called Tabga. Um, remember, go back to my initial uh, Sea of Galilee, and you've got Tabga up here on the lake. I've actually stood in this spot, and there's this mountainous spot um, that exists right on the sea, and, and there's a huge stone amphitheater that goes up from the lake, off the lake like this. And a, and a person, a man, could actually stand in that natural stone amphitheater and speak with a, with a male voice, strong male voice. I did it, and I had the group I was with go stand at the rim of this this canyon that could have held 15,000 people. And what's amazing is the acoustics of the lake are such with the gentle wind that comes off the lake and goes up into this natural stone amphitheater that you could have heard a man's voice. It was amazing. I had him go stand all the way at the rim of the canyon and I read this passage. It was so amazing. It really exists. This Jesus is really real. And this whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation not only holds water, but as you get into the original language, as you understand who he is and what he's saying, it makes so much sense you want to surrender your life to him again. That's why we're here. That's why we're here, to eat on this God. Okay, Lord, in that spontaneous, let me even say a prayer. Lord, as, this, as they broke bread and the spontaneous expansion of that bread happened that day, would you break bread in our midst, in us as a church and in your capital C church across America and around the world? And could we see the expansion of your church spontaneously in the name of Jesus? Okay, so that's Jesus is the new Moses. Let's dig into uh, Philip, the realist. I love Philip. He's another one I want to go ask. What were you thinking? <laughs> Y'all don't, you don't read the Bible like that? I always read it. I'm like, what was he thinking? That's probably what I just said, though, truthfully. 
When Jesus looked up, verse 5, he saw a crowd coming towards him, and he said to 15,000 people, by the way, this auditorium, if every single seat was filled, holds like 680 or 700 or something. So we're talking huge. I think um, uh, Trask Coliseum, some of your UNCW crew, I think there are 5,000 maybe there. So you're talking like three plus Trask Coliseums. I mean, a huge number of people. So uh, Jesus looks up, see the great crowd coming towards him, and he looks at Philip and he says, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked him this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Something I think is really important here is the test. Um, If you look at the Greek, that test is not like um, pass, fail. It's rather, it means prove. Uh, So in other words, um, Jesus' heart here is not that Philip would fail the test, but rather Jesus was giving him an opportunity so that he could um, prove Philip, that he could prove Philip's faith, although I'm not sure Philip participated. (laughs) Philip was a young man. Oh, well. So... uh, I, I, I love, I think, Jesus' heart there. Um, and, and the other thing that's just fascinating to me is as you look at Philip, and we're going to get to Andrew in a minute, but Andrew pipes up, um, verse 8, another of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Notice none of the other guys spoke up. Nobody. C- could they have spoken up? This is really important. Could they have spoken up? Yes. Okay. When, when uh, those of you who know your Bible, if you don't, you have to make a note and you'll have to fact check me. But uh, it, it, those of you who know your Bible, when Jesus, when the disciples were out on the um, Sea of Galilee in the middle of a storm and they were afraid they were going to sink, Jesus came out. And who initiated towards Jesus to get out and walk on the water with him? Peter. Peter. Now, did any of the other 11? No. Did Jesus initiate with Peter to come out to him? Peter asked. Lord, if it's you, Peter said, tell me to come out to you. And what did Jesus say? Come out. Now, I want you to see something here because you have Philip who got put on the spot. You got 10 guys who are hiding under the table going, don't call on me. And then you have Andrew who steps up and says, well, we got this boy with two loaves and, or five loaves and two fish. So Jesus responds to the one who initiates. You want more of Jesus? Initiate. You want to walk on water? What do you have to do? You got to get out of that boat. You want to participate in the miracle where Jesus breaks the bread and multiplies the loaves and fish? You got to take the risk. So I think he's also testing everyone here, all the disciples. I think the other thing that as we look at this that I would say, and some of you can begin to make some application into your own life here, but look at verse... Five, verse 6, excuse me. He already had in mind what he was going to do. Say that with me. He already had in mind what he was going to do. Some of you need to stop wringing your hands today. Because he already has in mind what he's going to do. The question is, are you going to participate with him in it or not? Might not be what you want. Might not be your timing, might not be what you thought you wanted or asked for, but he is about something. Here in this story, he's about something on on the huge level with all the crowds gathering in Israel. He's about something on the microcosm with the boy and his lunch, with Andrew, with Philip. He's about something in your life, both on the macro and on the micro. And the faster we as believers can begin to engage with this rich spiritual truth that God already has in mind what he's going to do. The question is, can we bow our knee and get on his page and go, Lord, you're your will, not my will. Oh, that's a hard lesson. That's what Missy was up here saying when she said, I'm finally broken enough. Amen. Okay. Um, I love that you see Jesus' heart here because he surveys a needy world with compassion. He's not without plans. He already has something that he's going to do. Christians right now are wringing their hands more than they ever have in my lifetime going, oh my goodness, everything's going to hell in a handbasket. Say it with me. Jesus already had in mind what he was going to do. Take a dig deep breath. The question is, Lord, how do we get on your page and begin to participate with you? Come on. Thank you, Emily. Okay, Um, I 
I think a question that I would ask before we move on to Andrew here just about Philip is, um, are you a Philip? In other words, have you parked your car in pessimism, in lack? Are you unable to even see that the kingdom of God and that King Jesus may have something more for you? Have you resigned yourself just to, well, we need a year's wages and a you know, herd of donkeys to haul all the bread out here. This will never happen. Oh, well, I'm going to give up and go home. Right? No, Philip's done. He's like, he's totally checked out. And if I find myself anywhere, it's probably that. Have you traded your faith and your trust for what you can manage, control, and produce? I don't want to live like that. I don't want to live like that. And I want us to be a church that is constantly not looking at what can't happen or what we think can't happen, but looks at the possibilities of what could God do if we surrendered it all, if we believed him. Okay, let's talk about Andrew here for just a minute. I love Andrew because he is always leading people to Jesus. I love this guy. He is not spoken of very much in the Gospels, but every time he comes up, he's always le- he led some of the disciples to Jesus. Um, in, in all of the Gospels, when he comes up, he's leading people to Jesus. And if there's anything when I get to heaven that I could be credited with, it's, oh, let me be an Andrew that I just kept leading people to Jesus. But I love Andrew because all he does is escort this little boy with his loaves and fish to Jesus. Here's a boy with, verse 8, with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? So he's not naive. He's not living in some ridiculous place in his brain. He knows if Jesus doesn't do a miracle, it can't happen. But he's open to the possibility, isn't he? I mean, come on, he's open and his heart is postured that he's going, who knows, maybe God will do something with this boy. Okay, so let's talk about the boy who gave up his lunch. How many of you have kids? I can't really separate my kids from a bite of their chocolate chip cookie. All right? Yeah, true. Like in our house, you know, you take something off somebody else's plate, you're going to get a hand pop. It's like, woo! You get something off Abby's plate, she'll get you. If I, you know, that's just, just the way it is. This, but I want you to go here a second, because this is so vital. This is a boy, and if it's, we're in peasant Galilee, how many meals do you think he gets a day? Come on, how many? One, maybe two. Somebody said maybe two. I probably agree with you. Maybe two. So, okay, he's not having his oatmeal and his special berries for breakfast or his protein shake or his little salad for lunch. No, no, no. He's got maybe one meal all day. And it's this little um, barley bread. And then it's these, these two little fish. And he is willing to give up his lunch. What you begin to see here is actually a parallel for who, what we as believers are called to do. Jesus, I can find seven times in the Gospels, all four of them, maybe eight, it depends how you count, where he preaches the Gospel. What is the Gospel? It's the good news of Christ Jesus. And I can find these seven times, but every time he preaches it, he says, take up your cross and follow me. In other words, he says, give up your lunch. That's scary. What if I really surrender it all to Jesus? What is he going to make me give up? Some of us say that, don't we? Some of us actually refuse to fully surrender everything to God because it's what in the world is he going to ask me to do? I'm going to have to sell it all and move to Africa. You might. I'm not going to tell you you won't. He also might make you a successful business person. You have no idea, and you're not going to know until you give up your lunch. Okay. So... <clears throat> two things here that are really important. Uh, this is barley bread. It's the only one of the Gospels that identifies it as barley bread. Barley bread is the cheapest of all the bread in this day and age. It's held in contempt by everyone who's wealthy. It's held in contempt by all the religious people. It's not accepted in Jerusalem as a real offering before God. Barley flour is not accepted, except in one case. Really interesting. Uh, there's, a, there's a thing in the Mishnah, which is the rabbi's interpretation of the Mosaic law, but there's a, there's a provision in the Mishnah where a woman caught in adultery can bring a trespass offering made of barley flour. Okay, so let's dig a little deeper. So Jesus takes what is hated and despised by people and he uses it to feed the masses. 
Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Okay. So I think what Jesus is actually beginning to unfold here is you Jerusalem, you Israel, you Jewish people are like a woman caught in adultery. But I'm going to break my body and I'm going to feed it to you and I'm going to lift you up from your lowly state. It's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture of what Jesus does here. And every single one of us are people caught in idolatry and adultery, literally in our hearts, in our minds, you, you fill in the blank. But this is the God who took what was despised by everyone and he uses it to feed the masses. Some of you are sitting in here today and you need to take such heart and encouragement because I don't care where you've been or what you've done or what's happened in your life or what's been done to you or how bad you've been abused. You can walk through that and King Jesus can lead you to life and wholeness and health and healing. And not only that, he can flip that whole thing and he can break that barley bread of your own brokenness and hurt and pain and he can use it to feed the masses. Listen to me. This is the God that will take the broken things and the silly things, the boy with this little silly lunch and two shriveled salty sardines and use them to feed the masses. That's the God I want to follow. That's the God I want to walk with. And if you, we as a people will come and surrender our lives before him at that level and degree, he will take us and make us in that resurrection power and transform us into a group of people that can reach and affect a generation. Come on. I think a question that Jesus is beginning to ask here of not just the 15 or more thousand people that are gathered, he's asking it of his disciples, but he's also asking it of us now, is are we too proud to eat barley bread with the masses? It's interesting because if we look at that, a lot of us refuse to offer what we have to Jesus because we go, well, it's not good enough. My life's not good enough. I don't know enough. I can't talk to that person. I can't get up there and say something in front of everybody because I haven't practiced enough. I, haven't go, I can't go pray with my neighbor because I'm not a good prayer. Come on, y'all hear me? We do this all the time. I don't know enough to share Jesus with somebody. I don't know enough to invite somebody to church. And we're, we're, it's actually both our insecurity and our pride that hamstring us and keep us from walking into the fullness of what God has for us when all he wants is that, the attitude of that little boy who just opens up and says, take my lunch. Take my lunch. And this is the God who will take your lunch and multiply it to feed the masses. That's what this God does. He transforms. It's the resurrection power of Easter. It's why we're here. He's the God who raises the dead. He broke the bounds of death and hell. He defeated sin once and for all. And he's allowed us and called us as believers into the finished work of Christ Jesus with him. That's what this thing is all about. Matthew 18, 3 says, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. Okay, let's move on to the crux of this whole thing and let's see if we can really discern what God's saying here. I'm convinced that one of the main essential things that he is communicating here is I Jesus am the God of the dead end because I'm the God of the breakthrough. I'm the God of the dead end because I'm the God of the breakthrough. I want you to think with me on that. If you go back to Exodus, Moses walked two and a half million people out of Egypt. They were in slavery and he led them right up to the banks of the what? the Red Sea. And you have Pharaoh's army driving down behind the people. And what do you think the people are saying? They're all freaking out. This is the God of the dead end. He leads them into the dead end of the Red Sea. Why? So he can part the waters and open the way. This is the God of the dead end. Think of the Jordan River when Joshua, we just read that in our one-year Bible, if you're reading your one-year Bible, but Joshua led them into the promised land, and they had to go up to the dead end of the Jordan River, and they actually had to put their feet into the Jordan River, and the river stood up in a heap. This is the God of the dead end because he's the God of the breakthrough. 
How many stops, if we look through Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, were the Israelites in the desert when there was no food and no water? And why did he do it? So he could provide. So he could show them the breakthrough. Now, I want you to think with me this morning on this Easter Sunday. Jesus had 12 disciples. One of them betrayed him. Jesus had a band of men and women that traveled with him. There was a group of 70. There was a group of 500 that he sent out at different points. But there's all these disciples around the 12. And the 12, think with me about those guys for a minute. They're all very young, 16 to 24, 25 probably. And they trade everything. Okay, so they abandoned mom and dad. They abandoned any hope of a future job. They abandoned occupations. They left homes. They're now homeless. Okay? Think with me. you got this group of people who is homeless, these, these 11 guys who are left. And they see Jesus on Black Friday go to a cross and what? Die. He's the God of the dead end. And sometimes he lets that dead end hang for a few days because he's the God of the breakthrough. He's the God of the breakthrough. Can you imagine the despair in those disciples when they've traded it all? They're now homeless. They've given everything they have. They've left their family. Some of their families probably hated them. And all of a sudden, Jesus dies and it's over? Come on. And then he breaks through and rises from the dead. He's the God of the dead end because he's the God of the breakthrough. Some of y'all are at a dead end in your life. And let me, let me um, put a qualifier on that. I've heard a lot of Christians march headlong into stuff that I would say is sin or wrong or foolishness and call it God. I'm not talking about that dead end. God will save you from that too once you surrender and call out. But there's a lot of us as people who find ourselves at dead end moments. And I want you to understand something, that the resurrection power of Easter is where God leads you to this dead end. And there's nowhere to go. You can't move any which way. And he has to open something up supernaturally. Some of you are at spots like that with marriages, with families, with kids, with grandkids, with your health, with your occupations, with all. There's so many different possibilities where you can be at a total dead end. And what I'm inviting you into today is like the boy with the fish just opening up and going, Lord Jesus, would you take my little loaves and fish? It's busted and I don't think it's very good and I don't think you can use me and I'm really insecure, but if I'll just give it to you, then this God of the dead end will open up a breakthrough and make a way that you don't even know is there. He is the God that will rule and reign and make a way. Is it going to be your way? Probably not. Is it going to be your time? Maybe not. Is it going to be what you wanted? Sometimes. But he's the God of the breakthrough. And he will walk you through that Red Sea passage. He's going to lead you out to the wilderness. And he's going to break bread and feed 15,000 people supernaturally. So I think the question for us becomes, are we too proud to throw ourselves into the arms of King Jesus? What I love about this Jesus is weakness is turned to strength with this God. Failure becomes a platform in the hands of this God. Your lack becomes his miracle. Some of you are sitting around waiting until you have something worthwhile to offer God, and he's actually waiting until you'll simply surrender your lunch. He cannot multiply what you don't relinquish. Some of you have spots in your life. You just need to go, Lord, I can't fix my marriage. Give it over. I can't fix my job. I've just lost someone. I can't fix this health thing. Give it over. Lay it down and let him make a way where there seems to be no way. Jesus is the God of the dead end because he's the God of the breakthrough. Amen and amen. He is risen. Daniel and Missy, would you guys come back out? I'd love to invite our prayer team to come down up here. I think we have six or eight people or couples who may be available for prayer.
Listen to me, church. I'm not sure where you find yourself today. I'm not sure where you are, but this is what I know. This is the God who wants to meet you in your brokenness and lead you to life. This is the God who will take whatever lunch you're able to give him, whatever meager gifts you think you have or don't have, and if you'll lay it down, he will take it and through the resurrection power of Christ Jesus, lift you up and send you out. Your failure, your brokenness, your sin can become a platform on which the hope of Jesus goes forth because he is risen. He is risen. Let's stand together as a church. If you need special prayer, I would love for you to come down here. Let me say something that's who knows what, maybe tongue in cheek. These aren't super spiritual people up here. They're super spiritual up there at the stage and I can't go down there because I'm not good enough. Would you turn loose of your lunch? Hear me? I'm not super spiritual because I'm up here. I've just gone, Lord Jesus, I got these five little barley loaves. Hear me, somebody, hear me. If you need prayer, roll down here. If you want to just stand down here and worship during this closing song, do that. This is the risen Christ Jesus, and it's worth celebrating. This is the God that takes the barley loaves and the fish and multiplies them. Let's worship together. If you need special prayer, come on down. If you want to give your life to Jesus, I'm going to be standing right here. Y'all lead us. That helps. There it is. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is.
powerful name it is the name of Jesus he is risen Father, as we go from this place, would you allow the resurrection power of King Jesus to enter into our lives, into our families, into our marriages, into our workplaces. Lord, would you allow the resurrection power of King Jesus to go before us and to come behind us. Lord, would you allow the resurrection power of King Jesus to be the thing that anchors us in every storm, to be the thing that gives us hope with the impossible situation, to be the thing that undergirds us. Father, would you allow the presence and the power of King Jesus to be the thing on which we build our lives. Father, we praise you on this Easter Sunday. We praise you because you're alive and you're well. Lord, we praise you because you're good. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As you go, go carrying the reality that he's the God of the dead end because he's the God of the breakthrough. We'll see you next week. Amen.